think you're up there now. <laughs> Not good. Hey, Josh. Welcome, hey. welcome, welcome to this ESU happy hour, Queen Victoria and the Victorian novel with Professor Elliot Engel. I'm, as always, Joshua Keppel Gonzalez, Director of Branch Services at the English Speaking Union of the United States. And today's happy hour is sponsored by the Shreveport, Louisiana branch. As ideas for these lectures come from you, our members and viewers and those and those of you who are at branches, please share any ideas or topics for an upcoming speaker or talk using the survey that will appear at the end of our program tonight. Before we get into that program, I want to make a couple of technical announcements. There will be a question and answer session at the end of this presentation. To submit your questions, please use the dedicated Q&A and chat modules that are at the bottom of your Zoom screen to type them in. You can submit them during any point of the presentation, but they will be answered in the order received during the dedicated Q&A session, which should last anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. I also want to take a moment to recognize the branches with the most registered members for today's happy hour. They are the Greenwich, Central Florida, and Shreveport branches. Now, to really start us off today, I'd like to welcome Shreveport Branch President Harvey Ann Linebrook. Harvey Ann? Yes. Hello. How is everybody? I hope you are ready for a wonderful program and I hope you enjoy every minute of it. I just want you to know that I am the president and uh, we are thrilled to be able to give you one of our very favorite, favorite speakers, and that is Dr. Elliot Engel. And I also want to back to talk about my branch that we, as he just said, that was a surprise. Uh, we have been the largest branch for many years, for many times throughout the years. And so we are very proud of that, but no comment that we make about our branch is complete without our talking about our dear leader who is no longer with us, Delton Harrison. He was responsible for our success and we dearly, dearly miss him. And now I would like to introduce Marlita Eddy, who is a board member and program chair, and she will introduce our speaker, Marlita. Thank you, Harvey Ann. Good evening, everybody. Elliot Engel is no stranger to Shreveport. He has spoken at our branch many times, and we have a, a saying in Shreveport about Dr. Engel. We say that he can talk about the wallpaper and make it interesting. So I think you will all agree with me after you hear him speak today that he can do just that. Dr. Elliot Engel 
now resides in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he has taught at the University of North Carolina, North Carolina State University and Duke University. He earned his MA and PhD as a Woodrow Wilson Fellow at UCLA. While at UCLA, he won that university's Outstanding Teacher Award. Dr. Engel has written 10 books published in England, Japan, Turkey, and the United States. His many lecture series on Charles Dixon's ran on PBS television stations around the country. His articles have appeared in numerous newspapers and national magazines, including Newsweek. He has lectured throughout the United States and all the continents, including Antarctica. Four plays which he has written have been produced during the last 10 years. In 2009, he was inducted into the Royal Society of Arts in England for his academic work and service in promoting Charles Dickens. For his, for his scholarship and teaching, Dr. Engel has received North Carolina's Adult Education Award, <laughs> North Carolina State Alumni Professorship, and the Victorian Sec Society's Award of Merit. Most recently, he was named Tar Heel of the Week for his 30 years of delivering public programs in the humanities and sponsoring state and national literary contests for high school students. Since 1980, Dr. Engel has been president of the Dickens Fellowship of North Carolina, the largest branch of this worldwide network of clubs. The sales of Dr. Engel's books, CDs, and DVDs have raised funds for the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which Dickens helped found in London in 1852. Professor Engel continues to teach outside the classroom and give literary and historical programs throughout the world. He also presents assemblies at elementary, middle, and high schools, and his educational CDs and DVDs are used in classrooms around the country. In his spare time, he likes to imagine all the impressive hobbies and leisure pursuits he could mention here. If he ever actually would find enough spare time to indulge in them. So I give you Dr. Elliot Engel. We're looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marlita. That was a wonderful introduction. I was going to say I'm thrilled to be talking on Queen Victoria, but I'll tell you, having heard that introduction, when you said, you know, he could even talk on wallpaper paste and make it interesting, I'm thinking, should I try that just to see if what you said was correct? No, no, I won't. We'll go to Queen Victoria, but thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I am delighted to be your happy hour speaker. I must say the topic of Queen Victoria and the Victorian novel is a peculiar one for a happy hour. You know, Queen Victoria and her long reign was called many, many things. But if you know anything about Queen Victoria, the one thing she was never called was happy. This was a dour woman. You know, she lost Albert so early, wore black all those years. My challenge isn't gonna to be to talk about wallpaper paste, but to make Queen Victoria as fascinating in the 21st century as she was in the 19th. Now, up until 2016, when I began to talk on Queen Victoria, I always said of everything she's known for, her greatest distinction is that she sat on the throne of England longer than any other monarch. 64 years she ruled. But you all know the English history. In 2016, our current queen, Queen Elizabeth II, as you certainly know, or you don't deserve to be in the English speaking union, she surpassed her. She went ahead of those 64 years. She is now the longest ruling monarch, of course, in English history. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but next year, 2022, will be her 70th year. And that is known as the platinum 
Jubilee. If she can make it just one more year, she will have a platinum Jubilee. And in case any of you are thinking, I wonder if she's gonna rule that long. I can take away all the mystery. I can tell you with authority that Elizabeth will be ruling at least until next year. And the reason I know this for a fact is because let's face it, we all know now when Queen Elizabeth goes to bed every night, her last thought before falling asleep has to be, you know, if I die in my sleep tonight, Charles will be King of England. That thought's gonna keep her going till she's a hundred on the throne, I'm convinced. But you're not here to hear about Elizabeth and Charles, you're here to hear about Queen Victoria. So let us get started. What I want to emphasize is that the odds of this woman who is now the second longest ruling monarch in English history ever coming to the throne were about zero. She was the least likely monarch of all to ever make it to rule. So we have to start the story of her, not with her, but with her grandfather, somebody we all know, of course, in American history, George III. Now, when George III was ruling in the middle of the 1700s, what was terribly important to him was not only did he want to rule, he knew when he died, his children would rule. And when they died, the grandchildren would rule. So above all, King George III wanted to have so many children that there would be no way for hundreds of years that there would not be in future generations a direct descendant. He and his wife, Queen Charlotte, came up with a really good way to do that. And you may know this about him, you may not. George III had 15 children. So of course he knew when those, you know, when he died, one of his children would rule. And then if that one didn't rule very long, then the next child would rule and then the next. But by then, the grandchildren would take over. And of course, with 15 children, you could imagine how many grandchildren there would be. And then great grandchildren on and on and on. That was the plan. It didn't work out that way at all. In fact, there was a terrible crisis while he was alive and people were convinced there wouldn't be many with his blood on the throne. Now, how can this be? He had 15 children. So, you know, how many grandchildren did those children produce? How many grandchildren, the children of George III's sons and daughters, how many did they produce who could rule? How many grandchildren? Not one. Now, I am telling you that he had 15 kids and those kids produced no grandchildren. Now, you're not gonna believe that. And this is early in my talk. I don't wanna be thought of as a liar. How can this be? Well, did those kids not produce any grandchildren as children? Well, of course they did. There were 15 of them. They produced 34 grandchildren. Not one of them legitimately. There's the problem. Of course his 15 kids produced all sorts of kids but they were not legitimate. Now, am I telling you that those 15 kids did not have one legitimate heir who could go on and rule England? Well, okay, no, only one though. Her name was Charlotte. And so this was what was supposed to happen. George III dies in 1820 and everybody knew his son, George IV, would take over. He already was regent. And when George the fourth would die, then the next brother, the, the eldest brother, of, in the next in line of George the, of George the uh, third, that son, whose name was William, would take over. But then what was going to happen? Well, George the fourth does take over and he does have one legitimate child named Charlotte. And so they thought, well, the monarchy would be saved. But unfortunately, if you know this story, Charlotte married and would produce an heir except George IV's daughter, Charlotte, in 1817.
15, when she was to give birth, the child was stillborn. And with the death of that child, now there is no legitimate heir to take over the throne when George IV would die and then his brother William would die. There was nobody and this scared everybody. So in 1817, when Charlotte died with that child, suddenly those 15 kids had a responsibility to produce a legitimate heir so this could go on. George III's children, who were all living happily with people they weren't married to, now had to do it. Well, these people, as you can imagine, were so immoral, having all these kids and none of them legitimate, it didn't look good until the London Times of all places said they would pay 500 pounds, which was a lot of money for the first child of George III who did his or her duty and produce a legitimate heir. So you have this weird race now in 1817 going on with the 15 kids to get rid of whoever they were living with and marry someone who could produce an heir. Well, the winner turned out to be the Duke of Kent, who was the third son of George III. The Duke of Kent had huge gambling debts. And actually, he had been happily unmarried to his mistress for 23 years. They were just a couple living in sin. They were a middle-aged couple. But when he saw in the paper that he could get 500 pounds for marrying somebody who'd be legitimate and producing an heir, the mistress knew when she read the paper and saw him packing his bags that she was finished. And so the Duke of Kent, needing to do his duty and get some money to pay off his gambling debts, he goes back to the fatherland, which you know is Germany, looking for a legitimate princess that he could marry and produce an heir first and get the money. Well, he finds one in a small area of Germany, a very obscure area. Her name is Princess Victoria. This is not our Victoria. This is her mother. But he marries Princess Victoria. And sure enough, she becomes pregnant right away. And after she's pregnant, they go to what we would call a county fair one day. And they go to a gypsy fair, uh, a gypsy um, fortune teller, and the gypsy fortune teller puts her hands on the pregnant Victoria's stomach and says, within you is the next queen of England. Turns out she was right, because it is Victoria who's in there. Well, they are thrilled, and there's no competition. Nobody else is pregnant from George III's uh, uh, either sons or daughters, and so they know they're going to win, and they are very happy until right before this child is to be born. In the eighth month, the Duke of Kent remembers that if a child is not born on English soil, that will eliminate that child from being the next monarch. So here's the Duchess of Kent, eight and a half months pregnant. They've got to get to England. They've got to get to the coast of France and get over there before the baby is born. Now, if you can believe it, and I wouldn't lie to you, I swear to this, he has such debt, the uh, Duke of Kent, that he can afford to rent a good carriage, but he doesn't have enough money to rent a driver as well. So he puts his pregnant wife in this coach in Germany. They have to race on the Audubon or whatever you called it back then to get out of Germany and into France. They go to the coast, they take a boat, they get over to England. And I mean, within about 26 days after they're on English soil, Victoria gives birth to a daughter, as the fortune teller had said it would be, they name her after her mother, and Victoria is born. All right, so now we've got the future monarch. But she is born in 1819. This is the last year of George III's reign. He dies in 1820. And as I said, his son, George IV, takes over, but he only lives 10 years. So you have George IV from 1820 to 1830. When he dies, the next son of George III, William, who will become William IV, takes over the throne in 1830, but he's old and sick. 
And in 1830, Princess Victoria now is 11 years old. And when her uncle, William, takes the throne, her mother, the Duchess of Kent, knows she's got to tell her daughter that when that old man dies, and it probably won't be long, she will become Queen of England. So the Duchess of Kent, named Victoria, tells her daughter Victoria when she turns 11, you know, when the king dies, you are the next ruler. And what did Victoria do? She burst into tears and she said, then I will be very, very good. And by golly, she will be very, very good. Well, her mother, the Duchess of Kent, is very ambitious. She wants her daughter on the throne right away. But her daughter's only 11, and she wants her brother-in-law, King William IV, to drop dead the sooner the better, because you realize if he would die before Victoria is 18, then there'd be a regency. And guess who would become the regent? The mother, the Duchess of Kent. And so William IV cannot stand his sister-in-law, the Duchess of Kent, because he knows she can't wait for him to die so she can take over and she'll be regent until Victoria turns 18. And worse than that, the Duchess of Kent, to get the public all stirred up and wanting a new monarch because William is old and sick, she actually rents large halls throughout England from the time Victoria is 12 until she's about 17. And about once every couple of months, she'll hold a huge town meeting where she introduces her daughter, Victoria, as the next monarch. And basically the way she does it is by basically saying, you know, when the old man on the throne is dead, look at the coming attractions, a beautiful young woman in a whole new rule in a whole new era. Well, of course, William is conscious of what his sister-in-law is doing. He is furious and the King William is very upset that if he would die before Victoria's 18, the Duchess of Kent basically will rule. So what happens? Well, William gets older and older and sicker and sicker and Victoria gets to be 15 and 16 and 17 and the King is holding out and holding out. And this is too good to be true, but it is. And William holds out until his niece, Victoria, turns 18 and about two weeks. And then he drops dead with a big smile on his face because he knows he has lived just long enough so that the Duchess of Kent will not rule and his niece, the innocent Victoria, will take over. He was able to hold out. You know, we all hear about how wonderful the power of love is and how strong it is. It's true. But you know, this tells us the power of hate isn't bad either. He so despised that Duchess of Kent that he held out, held on to his life so that finally Victoria herself would reign. And although Victoria is just 18 when she takes over, she does not want her mother interfering. And so the first act, the first signed act that Victoria passes as queen is to have her mother's bed removed from Victoria's bedroom. Because when William was alive and she was training her daughter how to become a great queen, she slept right next to her. So late at night, if she had a good idea about how Victoria should be ruling, she could tell her. So with her daughter moving her mother out, we learn real early that Victoria is going to reign. That is the incredible story. I don't think I oversold it of how this woman came to be queen. But I, you probably know the title of my talk is Queen Victoria and the Victorian Novel. Well, that's the story of Victoria. But as you heard in the introduction, I'm an English professor. I'm interested in Victoria, but what I'm really interested in 
is the Victorian novel. And that's what I want to turn to, the kind of thing that was written in Victoria's reign. Now, why would I be interested in the Victorian novel? Here's why. There has never been an age in the history of literature in English that has produced more brilliant novels than the Victorian age. 40,000 novels were written, a huge percentage of them great, quite a few still read today as classics. It seems like in many ages, there's a particular type of writing that becomes immortal. As you know, in the Renaissance, it's not the novel, the novel hadn't been invented yet, it's drama. Of course, Shakespeare is one reason, but there were many great dramatists in the Renaissance age. In the Romantic period, it's the poets, but in the Victorian period, it is the novel. So the first question I wanna answer is, why in the Victorian period do we have all these great works of fiction? Is it because Victoria was just terribly interested in literature. That is not the answer. Now, Queen Elizabeth I, when Shakespeare was alive, she was brilliant. She was a great poet, as a matter of fact, translated eight different languages. She was on top of the literary scene and she probably helped inspire Shakespeare. That is not the case with Victoria. She was a bright woman, but she didn't care that much about literature. So why suddenly? When she comes to the throne in 1837, when she's 18, as you know, years old, does the novel just take off? Well, at this point, I must give you probably the main reason, and lucky for me, it has to do with my field of specialization, which some of you, if you've heard me talk at your branch know, is Charles Dickens. It turns out an incredible coincidence happened in 1837, when Victoria first ascends to the throne. The coincidence, Charles Dickens publishes his first novel, The Pickwick Papers. It's a good novel, it's certainly not immortal, it's not Jane Eyre, it's not Wuthering Heights. But the thing, if you've ever heard me talk about Dickens that you know, and I'm not gonna talk about it tonight, as a matter of fact, is that with that first novel, Pickwick Papers, for the first time in history, novels were brought out in serialization. Dickens came up with the idea, don't publish a novel all at once, publish it three chapters at a time, once a month. So people would have to go out the first day of each month by the next three chapters. It was a revolutionary idea, but that's not what I wanna deal with. I wanna deal with the consequences of people for the first time, not reading a novel all the way through, but going out once a month so that they would live with it for about a year and a half. Let me tell you what that did in the history of the novel. Now, you know, in the Victorian period, the family was everything. Now we're talking about upper middle class, upper class, and some middle class. You know, families were a unit and the moral education of the children was certainly in the family. So now that novels beginning in Victoria's reign in 1837 are coming up once a month, this is what happened. The father of the family would of course go to work every day and come home at night. But on the first day of the month, the father would stop at the stationer's store or the bookstore and he would get the next installment of, let's say, a Dickens novel. Now he would bring it home, let's say he comes home at five o'clock, and rather than greeting the family, on the day he came home with the latest installment of a novel, what he would do, he would go into his study, he would close the door, and then the family, if they were listening, would hear from their father or husband, if it's the wife listening, great laughter and occasionally tears. Here's why. Because it was the father's duty after dinner to get his wife and children in the parlor and he would read aloud to the family the latest installment. You couldn't do that when it was just a novel, it was too long, but now that it was just three chapters at a time, it was family entertainment. But the reason that he went into that study before dinner was because someone like Charles Dickens wrote so brilliantly 
that the funny scenes were so funny and the pathetic scenes were so sad that the father would read them over a few times before dinner. So when he actually read it to the family after dinner, he wouldn't spoil it because Dickens had the power of making that father burst out in laughter in the comic parts and sob tremendously in the uh, tragic part. So he had to get that out of his system. Okay, so it's now after dinner and the mother calls, let's say she has two children, Tommy and Sally. She calls them into the parlor. The father sits by the fire and he reads the latest three chapters to um, the family. But here's the fascinating thing. He didn't read all three at once. Generally what happened is the father would read a chapter of Dickens or someone else, let's say during the Victorian period. And then after that chapter, the mother's role came into being. After hearing the chapter, the mother would say to let's say little Tommy and little Sally, uh, she'd say now children, what moral lesson do you think Mr. Dickens was teaching us in that chapter? What did Mr. Murdstone represent? What was Pip challenges? I'm telling you that what we usually have in Sunday school today, they had in their home, they looked at these works of literature as moral teachings, but delightful ones. It made the kids laugh and cry too. So you had this wonderful family unit and they were getting moral lessons. So that's the first thing that the Victorian novel did that made it so famous, families got together and they would discuss important issues based on whatever Dickens or whoever the other uh, novelists they were reading were putting in the book. But that's certainly not all of it. I told you that the father read it aloud to the mother and the family. Well, if you were even lower middle class and you were a servant, it would probably be the butler who would buy it and read it aloud to the cook and everybody else. In other words, it turns out in the Victorian period for every one person who read a Victorian novel, seven people were listening to it. Not to say they couldn't read, though some of them were illiterate, but Victorian novelists knew when they wrote their paragraphs, they had better write it not to be read beautifully, but to be read aloud beautifully. There had to be great rhythms in Victorian uh, fiction prose so that when it was read aloud by the father or the butler or whatever, people would listen and remember. And that is why probably the most famous first paragraph written in English than I can think of in a novel went like this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. Now, as you all know, you are members of the English speaking union. That is from Charles Dickens's <clears throat> Tale of Two Cities, 1859. But I wanna go back and show you what's going on there. All right, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of uh, belief, it was the epic of incredulity. All right, remember the children, let's take 11 year old little Tommy listening to his father read that. Well, I told you that he's gonna get a moral education from Dickens, but just as good, he's gonna get a vocabulary lesson. And Dickens knew this. Now, if you say it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, there's a name for that kind of style. Obviously, it uses opposites. You have the same sentence structure, but the last word in the first part is the opposite of the other. Obviously, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. So here's little Tommy sitting there and he's hearing this. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. He knows what that means. It was the age of wisdom, he knows that word. It was the age of foolishness, he knows that they're opposites. But then Dickens writes, it was the epoch of belief, 
It was the epic of incredulity. I don't need to tell you that an 11-year-old has no idea what incredulity means unless he's listening to Tale of Two Cities because that kid is sharp enough to know best of times, worst of times, opposite, age of uh, wisdom, age of foolishness, opposite, epic of belief, he knows what belief means, epic of incredulity, he doesn't know what that means, but he knows because Dickens uses antithesis that incredulity has to be the opposite of belief. And so he knows just by hearing Dickens that incredulity must mean disbelief, the opposite of belief. And that is exactly what it means. And so that child is learning vocabulary just by listening to Charles Dickens. All right, there's two things that the Victorian novel did that I hope you didn't know. It taught kids morality, it caught kids vocabulary, but here's something I hope you didn't know either. Do you realize that before the railroad train was invented, and let's get this straight, when was the railroad train invented? Right about the time Victoria came to the throne, where in England, in about the late 1830s. Did you know that before the train was invented, the fastest a person could travel on earth, on land, was about 18 miles an hour on a galloping horse. Now, not only is that not all that fascinating, but you should be thinking, if you're still paying attention, what does this have to do with the Victorian novel? I'll tell you what it has to do with it. With the invention of the train, the Victorian novel sales would explode. Here's why. Before the Victorian age, people were traveling all the time. But if you traveled by land before the Victorian age and the railroad train was invented, do you know how you traveled? Of course you did, you traveled by stagecoach. And the journeys were terribly long, so you may think, Wow, they must have taken some good novels to read to pass the time on the stagecoach. Well, you may be surprised to learn that they didn't take any novels to read. I mean, you could take a novel and you could travel by stagecoach and you could try and read it, but unfortunately it would be difficult because you'd probably be throwing up on the novel page because with no shock absorbers back then, the way that the coach rattled and rattled you, there was no way you could be holding something up. And most of the time, there was no way, no matter how good your eyes were, it would focus. You were just trapped. You might be able to see newspaper now and then, but reading fiction was out. But now, with the invention of the train, and what we always hear about the train is, before the train, you could only go 18 miles an hour, with the invention of the train, you could go 52 miles an hour at maximum speed when you were going from one place to another, but we don't care how fast you could go. What we care about is for the first time in history, you were in a compartment that was not regulated by the horse's hooves. And so most of the time, you not only were going 52 miles an hour, it was as smooth as if you were in your living room. And you know what you did in your living room to pass the time, you read novels. And now, because the train was smooth and you were trapped in that compartment for hours, like you were in a stagecoach, except you couldn't read on a stagecoach, now suddenly you passed your time by reading the Victorian novels. I mention this because if you would have gone to a train station during the Victorian reign and Victoria's reign, and you wanted to get on the train, you would have trouble seeing the train itself on the track. And you know why? Because all around the track where you were going to enter the train, there was one book stall after another. Novelists and their publishers figured out that they had a captive audience with these people who had nothing to do, but they still could read because it was smooth. And so they were selling not hundreds, not thousands, but tens of thousands of novels during the Victorian period that could never be sold before because people didn't have the pleasure and the leisure 
and the smoothness of reading. Nothing made more sales of the Victorian novel than the ability to travel and read it at the time. These steam locomotives were perfect. You know, we always hear about things running out of steam. Well, in the Victorian period, the novel didn't run out of steam. It ran into steam. It was the steam engines that allowed the novels to go all the time. These are just a few of the things that made the Victorian novel so wildly popular and innovative. Now, I love the Victorian period. I love Victorian novelists, but as we all know, if you love something enough, you've got to be able to speak about the negative as well as the positive. So now we come to the huge negative of the Victorian novel. You can find almost everything in a Victorian novel. It is amazingly realistic and deep. But the one thing that nobody can say, oh, the Victorian novel did it so well, is the portrayal realistically of young women. I need not tell you that Dickens and every other male Victorian novelist, not the females, uh, um, Jane Eyre is very different, but that was written by Charlotte Bronte. But most male authors, when they came to their female characters, had a huge, huge problem. And if you've read any Victorian novels, which I know you have, you know what it is. In the Victorian period, a woman, young woman in particular, could not be portrayed realistically. Why? Well, it turns out, you know, even Victorian boys, when they were being raised in their family, they were taught that you do not treat a young girl, let's say if you're a young boy or a young woman, you did not treat a young woman like a human being. They actually thought in the Victorian period that girls were not human. Now they didn't think that girls were less than human, they thought girls were far greater than human. They believed that girls were so good and so smart and so pure and so absolutely perfect in every way. Young men were taught, do not treat girls like human beings. Instead, you treat them like angels to be worshiped from afar. Now, if you're a woman, you may think, well, I probably could put up with that, but you couldn't. And you see this in the Victorian novel. Treating women like angels was not good for women. It was not good for men. I mean, the Victorians believed that women were such angels that they actually taught their young men that when they talked to a young woman, let's say when a young man at school talk to a young woman at school. You could talk to women if you were a young man at school, but it was a fact because they regarded women as such angels. During the Victorian period, you could not mention any part of the body below the neck in the presence of a young woman. Now, you could say to a young woman, ear or nose or eye or even chin, that was allowed. But if you were a young man who was vulgar enough to ever say arm in front of a woman, or if you were really filthy and you said leg where that woman could hear it, etiquette told these young women that if they ever heard any part of the body below the neck, they were supposed to faint, fall on the carpet, and go unconscious or their reputation could be ruled. I don't make this stuff up. If you know about the Victorian fainting couch, one of the reasons they had so many was if a woman heard any part of the body below the neck in her presence, that's what she was supposed to do. She was not supposed to stand there. If she stood there and her leg or arm in front of her, her reputation was gone. She was then called a woman with loose ears. This didn't mean her ears didn't fit. This meant she could hear filthy talk like this and remain standing. I kid you not. This caused all sorts of 
problems, particularly on Sunday after church. Because if you know anything about the Victorian schedule, every Sunday the family would go to church. They would come home and then at noontime, they would sit down for the big meal of the day, which was called Sunday dinner. You had it at noon. Now, at Sunday dinner, it turns out there wasn't much choice for a main course. If you had Sunday dinner during the Victorian period in your family, the only main course you were ever served was chicken because there was lots of it and it wasn't very expensive. But here comes the problem. If you had a young woman in your family between the ages of 12 and 24 and you sat down for a chicken dinner, you were not permitted to ask out loud for any part of the chicken below the neck. Now, of course, if you wanted a chicken beak or a chicken eye, you could have that, but let's face it, none of us want a part of a chicken that's not below the neck. But in the Victorian age, because they regarded women as such ethereal angels, you couldn't say, please pass a chicken leg. That was considered vulgar. And my goodness, if you wanted a breast or a thigh, all the girls would have collapsed in the mashed potatoes and that would have been it for your family. You actually couldn't ask for chicken below the neck. Well, you may wonder how they get fed at Sunday dinner in the homes. I'll tell you how. The servant would come out with a platter of chicken. It was always put in front of the father's place because he was the head of the family. And then he would hold up each piece of chicken. When he came to the piece you wanted, you were allowed to point at it and it was passed down to your plate so you never had to say the vulgar part aloud. But you know, this wasn't good. You know, it was waved about, then you pointed to it. By the time it was passed down to your plate, it was cold, this was not working. And so they came up with a solution. In fact, they came up with it in America. A minister in the state of Massachusetts in the 1850s to solve this problem actually stared at a whole chicken long enough until he could say, I am now able to divide all chickens into two equal parts. We're now going to call half the chicken white meat and the other half dark meat. You know, Colonel Sanders didn't invent those terms. They were invented in the Victorian period because you couldn't say the parts of the chicken aloud. Well, how'd that work out? Not bad, but not good. Because now you could say at the Victorian table, please pass me a piece of white meat, but you only had a one in three shot of ever getting the proper uh, piece. So they refined it because in the 1870s, again in America, there was a young man in Ohio, who when his family sat down for Sunday dinner, you know, he could say dark meat or white meat, but all he wanted was chicken legs. That's what he loved. And he, you know, he said, please pass dark meat, but he never usually got the leg right off. So he came up with an incredible idea. Now this young man was a musician. And so he stared at the chicken leg long enough till it reminded him of something that you could say aloud in the presence of his sisters. He, of course, thought the chicken leg looked very similar to a drumstick. He named it drumstick in 1873. We are still calling a chicken leg a drumstick today, but the reason we call it a drumstick was because in Dickens's day, the Victorian period, you actually couldn't say a name like that aloud. Another example. It turns out that if in a big room there was a gathering of people, let's say a gathering of young men sitting in chairs, and then suddenly the door would open and a young lady would come in. Well, of course, she's an angel and she must be treated differently. So I'm sure it doesn't surprise you that as soon as a woman came in, the young man jumped up and he offered his chair to the woman to sit. That doesn't surprise you. But what might surprise you is this. When that young man offered his chair, got up quickly and asked the young lady to sit in it, that young lady's mother would have taught her from her earliest years that you never ever sat 
in a chair offered to you by a young man who just got up until you counted to 10 quietly to yourself. Now, why did Victorians, both in America and in England, insist that their daughters count to 10 until they sat in the chair? You'll find this hard to believe, but it is true. They actually worried in the 19th century that if that young woman sat down too quickly after the young man got out of the chair, there still might be some of that filthy male body heat from the man's rear end keeping that chair warm. And they didn't want their daughters to get a quick, cheap thrill from sitting in a chair, now don't knock it till you've tried it, that was warmed up by a man's rear end. I kid you not. This is why in the Victorian novels, when you read, and Dickens is a genius, but gosh, his women heroines, Lucy Manette, Dora, Agnes, they're dreadful because they can't be real characters because they weren't allowed to be real blood. You know, they are bloodless people in the novels because they couldn't be the typical female as she should be with the same passions as males during that period. It's just the fact. And finally, I do want to mention that because young women are treated like such angels, sex education was nowhere. I mean, a mother couldn't teach her daughter before she got married about sex, could she? Because I mean, if you can't say anything below the neck, that'd be a problem. And this was just too embarrassing. And so the problem became Victorian girls in both America and England, when they got married, they knew nothing about the physical side of marriage. Do you know when they learned it, since they couldn't learn it before, they learned it all at once on the wedding night. When the husband explained what was going on, well, women heard this for the first time. I'm sure some of them thought it must be a sick joke. Talk about fainting dead away. I'm sure some of them were taken away uh, it, to the hospital. They knew nothing about sex until they married. Things got so bad that in the latter part of Queen Victoria's reign, when she was made aware of this, she commissioned, the Crown commissioned a book for the uh, middle and upper middle class women, in, young women in her kingdom, to teach them what they needed to know about the physical side of marriage before they married. It's an actual book. It was called The Wedding Night. It's 540 pages long. And know before you run out and get it from Amazon or the bookstore, don't waste your money. What this wedding night book is really about, the Victoria sanction, most of it, almost all of it is what wedding hall you should rent for the wedding night. What are the respectable places to be when you get married? It's all about society. It's all about the things you would expect Victoria. But Victoria promised, her young women, that it would be a physical guide to marriage. And so at the end of the book, under a heading extremely personal, you will find what was said in the book that Victoria and the Victorians in general thought was all young women needed to know to understand that side of marriage. Some of you have heard it. I'm going to quote it aloud. I don't think it'll cause a blush on anybody's face. It is so short, but it is graphic and detailed. What did the Victorians want their young ladies to know about the physical side of marriage? Here's what the book says. Quote, close your eyes, grit your teeth, and think of England, unquote. That's it. Now, some of us may find it funny today, but when you think about it, these girls were regarded as such angels that they weren't even able to understand these kinds of things that the birds and the bees have been taught after the Victorian period from very young age, it is sad. And it does leave me with my final point about why during the Victorian period are all these heroines in literature so sappy and so bloodless, except for the ones written by women, not all of them, but most of them, and certain, not older women, they can be fascinating, but not the young women. Well, I'll tell you, the reason that all this was necessary was because of the most famous writer during the Victorian period. His first name is Charles and his last name begins with D. And no, it's not Charles Dickens. By far, 
a more famous author in general during the Victorian period was Charles Darwin. And it was Darwin's great work, Origin of Species, and published in 1859, same year as Tale of Two Cities. In that book, when he makes it clear that we are descended from apes, the Victorians became very, very nervous. They had to convince themselves they had nothing in common with those beasts. Well, what they did know is that those beasts and they themselves had two physical instincts. They couldn't deny them, beasts, apes, and we have them. You know what your two physical instincts are. You have an instinct for hunger and an instinct for sex. Well, it didn't bother them that they shared hunger with the beasts because they saw how apes ate. And so the Victorians made sure that eating was this high social occasion. You invited all your friends, you had a beautiful white tablecloth, you served 18 courses. The eating instinct, the hunger instinct was nothing like what's in the beasts. But they had a big, big problem with the sex instinct. And so we feel for what it was because people were worried about this, the idea that we had the same sexual urges as the beasts, that the Victorians and the Victorians really alone, the 18th century before them, they had very bawdy novels, Tom Jones, but the Victorians had to turn their women into angels so that the sexual act, as they said back then, procreation, not recreation, and these women were angels and therefore nothing like the kind of animals that Darwin said we were descended on. Well, the hour is up. I hope I've encouraged you to ask a few questions, but before I turn it over to the question and answer, I wanna follow up on something Harvey Ann said at the beginning. I have been invited to the Shreveport ESU branch 28 times. I began in 1984 and for all of them, it was Delton Harrison who led the club. I know Harvey Ann, and, uh, but it was Delton who hired me, Delton who encouraged the people to have me. And I just wanna say this about Delton Harrison. We always hear, if you're gonna have a good organization, you've got to delegate. You don't put all the power in one person. And that is absolutely true, except for Delton Harrison at the Shreveport ESU. He so loved pleasing his members. It meant so much to him to have people come together for fellowship, for drink, listen to a great lecture, appreciate England. He ran that branch, not because other people tried to run it and he wanted to do the whole show. He didn't, but he was so wonderful and so kind and so funny and so loving that nobody in his or her right mind would ever think that he needed replacing. And so it was a great joy to me after the terrible sadness when I heard of Delton's death that Harvey Ann, who would never replace him, no one will ever replace Delton, but someone who loved him as much as she did is now taking over in his spirit. Okay, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Well, we certainly have a queue of questions lined up, so let's, uh, let's okay. try to move through them. Um, so our first question is from Robin Sinclair from our Nashville branch, who asks, what do you consider the greatest Victorian novel, or perhaps the three greatest? Okay, the three greatest Victorian novels. I'll tell you, there's always, these English professors have decided that during the entire Victorian period, when there were 40,000 novels, the ones that stand out the most are Vanity Pair by William Th uh, Makepeace Thackeray, um, <clears throat> Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, and the last one, Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Let's do that again. Dickens's Tale of Two Cities, Dickens's uh, Great Expectations, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, and Thackeray's uh, um, Vanity Fair. Now, being in Dickens, I was always so proud that my man had two of the great five 
But as someone pointed out, well, that's nice. But the real stunner is the two sisters from the same family would produce two of the other five. That's the great story that the Brontes, separate people, but same family, could come up with Wuthering Heights and with uh, Jane Eyre. So I agree that probably those five, but let's face it, it's not a horse race. It's a wonderful thing to think about, but everybody's taste is different. But to me, the most perfectly written novel is Great Expectations because it's short. And someone once said, there has never been a better dissection of snobbery in anything ever written than Great Expectations. And if you remember Pip and Miss Havisham and Sweet Joe, it is an expose of what happens to us when we turn into snobs, when we think we have great expectations. Thanks, that's a good question, mainly because I could answer it. All right, our next question is from Richard Mueller who asks, which English county influenced the most Victorian novels? A bit of a geography question there. <laughs> I have never been asked that. I've never thought of it. But my answer is going to have to be what we call the home counties, the ones, and I'm sure that I'm sure he has a different answer. And that is because so many great novelists lived at least in the London area. So I'm sure that's the wrong answer. But what comes to me immediately, it has to be someplace within London or close to London. On the other hand, you know, Yorkshire, the largest county, produced Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre, so right, and plenty of other things too, Bram Stoker's Dracula, but I'm going with the home counties. I'd be curious what he, th does he have, does he have the right answer with the question? No submission of an answer, so. Yay, so let's pretend I'm right. <laughs> Our next quest question is from Sarah Hansard. It's a, it's a long one, so um, has some exp uh, exposition here. I was under the impression that the age of reason and the growth of democracy and the rise of the middle class after the glorious revolution of 1689, and that literacy rates climbed above 50% in England in the 18th century, which showed the development of the print press stories and papers and novels such as Daniel Defoe, arguably the father of modern novels, Henry Fielding, Thomas Mallory, Jonathan Swift, Philip Sidney, John Bunyan, all of which are still read today. Wasn't the Victorian era a continuation? Excellent question. And everything, and, and was she, correct? Did you say it was a Sarah? Sarah, yes. Everything she said is absolutely correct. But the Victorian era should have been a continuation. And had Dickens not invented the soap opera and the serialization, it would have been. But because he published his novels once a month, three chapters at a time, the people in the 18th and early 19th century before Victoria reigned in 1837, those people, many of them, they were literate, but they were scared away by long novels, by Dickens chopping them up and making them more palatable to those who weren't great readers. And then the other thing is that eyeglasses in the, Victorian, in the Victorian era took a huge step forward. And so many people who could not see to read because of astigmatism were able to read for the first time. Yes, the literacy did not jump up that much. It had been, as she said, growing in a nice pace beforehand, but it was the invention of the serialization that opened it up to also everybody who was illiterate because they could hear it. And I used to think, you know, well, those people, the, the servants who listen to it, it's not like really reading a novel, but I'll, I'll be honest, when I now put an audio book in my, you know, I still have the, uh, the tape deck that shows you how old my car is, and I listen to a novel, I'm not so sure that my listening to it is anything inferior to having reading it with my eyes. So I'm, I think these people were getting the Dickens novel just as brilliantly by listening to it that they weren't reading. But before this age, there was no hope for those people who were intimidated by long works. 
So our next question is from Hannah Lore Noble from the Boston branch. And I believe you already talked about this a bit when you mentioned older women being able to be more fully characterized. But did not Dickens create memorable women characters with Betsy Trotwood or Miss Havisham? And in Great Expectations, was the young woman that Pip longed for what we might consider an angel? Ah, excellent question. And yes, I'm so glad I qualified it. Dickens was great with any woman who was not who was over the age of what he would call sexually attractive or romantically involved. So yes, Betsy Trotwood, and let's face it, Betsy Trotwood could have been a man as well. There's nothing feminine about her, screaming donkeys and getting all upset with things. You know, his older women characters, their sex, their gender is not important. But when, um, when she asked, the woman's name was Estella. Miss Havisham reared Estella, her ward, to lure people like Pippin and then break their hearts because her heart was broken at the altar when she was jilted. So yes, Estella was this angelic, typical Victorian woman. But Dickens being so brilliant, he made sure that she was warped and made completely unable to love a man back so that Miss Havisham through her could get her revenge on the young man who didn't love her back. But yes, of course she had to mold her in the shape of an angel, but she was no angel. She was frigid in a way that no Victorian woman should have been, but Miss Havisham made sure she couldn't love Pip back. Absolutely, good question. Our next question is from David Coslow, who asks, Queen Victoria was a relentless diarist. In her near daily entries, does she discuss novels and novelists? She does. And I mean, in her, it's amazing. She not only writes every day, but her style is excellent. I mean, let's face it, you know, her first language was not English. It was German. I mean, her mother is the Duchess of Kent, you know, from Germany. English is her second language. And yet if you read her diaries, they are so literate and she does discuss. She says which one she loves. She talks about characters. I mean, she is a typical of that age and I don't mean to be sexist. She was a typical female author of the uh, author. She's a typical female reader of Victorian novels because she, she doesn't talk about swooning over male characters but she talks about identifying with these lovely young women, which of course she would because she wants all of her uh, subjects to be angels. Yes, lots of her entries, but I'll tell you, painting also. She loved a, a painter named Landseer. Uh, she, painting, she was not particularly deep in her appreciation of fine arts, but she is wide as a mile and she appreciates a lot, but it had to be moral. That's the keystone. Great, so our next question is from Donald Patillo of our Atlanta branch, who asks, does the Victorian denial of sexuality explain why so many young Victorian girls became prostitutes? I mean, it's an outstanding question and it is directly relevant. Listen to this, if you did, there were more prostitutes per capita in the Victorian era than in any other era in England. And the answer is simple. You know, we're not gonna do away with our two physical instincts, eating, they figured out a way to do it. Men still had that sexual instinct and they couldn't, they absolutely couldn't defile young women. And so prostitutes filled the bill. Everything I've said about the morality of the Victorian age only applies to middle and upper middle class women. Lower class women did not have that at all. In fact, you know, I told you that before women married, they could know nothing about sex, and yet their husbands were very experienced pretty much by it. Now, if the women weren't having sex that they were marrying and the men had lots of sex, how can this be explained? Now, you might say, oh, it's explained because they went to prostitutes. That's only half the story. Yes, these upper middle class men who married respectable middle class women, they went to prostitutes, but they didn't have to because it turns out that the upper class didn't have to have morals, but lower class women didn't have to have morals either because their reputations couldn't be ruined because there was no reputation to begin with. If you didn't have money, no one interesting was gonna be um, uh, you know, going out with you. So these lower class women who were not prostitutes, they just liked sex. 
And there was no taboo because nobody cared about him. So it's the upper class men having sex with the lower class women until they marry. Then when they marry, they decide to turn to prostitutes. All right, our next question from William David Hunker. I have been a fan of Anthony Trollope for years. I've read the Barchester in parliamentary novels. Do you have a recommendation for one of his later novels? Wow, you know he wrote 64 novels, each three volumes long. So we're talking about 128 volumes. And as far as a later work, I believe the way we live now is a later work. But to me, and particularly for those of you who haven't read Trollope yet, there are two novels that you must read if you want to get into Anthony Trollope. One of them is called The Warden, and the other is called Barchester Towers. The Warden is very short. Barchester Towers is a pretty good length. Oh, and the other one, The Last Chronicle of Barset. And it's not a late, late novel, but it's fairly late. So those are the ones I highly recommend. The Way We Live Now, The Last Chronicle of Barset, um, The Warden, and Barchester Towers. Particularly, if you've never read Trollope, read those, because if you don't like those, you won't like anything else, because they're about as good as it gets. But if you like them, then you can go back and start reading them all. I've read all of Trollope. Well, I don't remember all of Trollope, but I think I finally made my way all the way through. Now, my, he's a marvelous novelist, but what I have to say about everybody, he's not Dickens, but he's good. Actually, our next question is slightly related from Debbie Weiss, who asks, what do you think of Elizabeth Gaskell and Trollope? Um, but you've already mentioned I've said Trollope, but I Elizabeth love Gaskell. Elizabeth Gaskell. And to me, North and South, if you want to read a book about the problems, the social problems, the money problems, her North and South is wonderful. She wrote a whole bunch of other things. Wives and Daughters is my favorite. So I love Mrs. Gaskell. But as opposed to Charlotte Bronte and Jane Eyre, she can't create a Jane Eyre character who doesn't give a darn that she's a woman. She's gonna be as aggressive and assertive as she can to get her happiness uh, with a man. So Mrs. Gaskell doesn't really break tradition like Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte does. Good heavens, Heathcliff and Kathy, that isn't about the angel in the house. But Mrs. Gaskell is wonderful, traditional but wonderful, and Wives and Daughters, which was her last work. And I think she died before it was quite finished, but it is finished. I think they had the notes. That's what I'd recommend. All right, so uh, I think two questions left. Uh, okay. Adele Stern asked, what was the impact of the Industrial Revolution, aside from the train trips, on the storytelling and evolution of relationships between men and women? Wow, that is a really good question. Now let's, you know, we always think of the Industrial Revolution and the Victorian period, but you know, it started way back in the 18th century. The 1860s on, you felt the, the Industrial Revolution in literature, in poetry, in novels. And you know, Victoria doesn't come to the throne until almost 1840. So from 1760 to 1840, that's 80 years of the influence of the Industrial Revolution. It's a shame that people relate it to the Victorian era. It just came to its height in the Victorian period, but the, but it, the influence was there. And the relationship really is that in the factories, men and women were not called men or women, they were called hands, H-A-N-D-S. They were just hands there to help with the profit of making certain products. And so there was a real equality. The women who worked in those factories were not angels of the house because A, they weren't in the house. They were just men disguised as women, I mean, there are women, of course, but who were paid a lot less, but there was an equality there, but it's a depressing one because it was based on economics. Women were paid less, but they were pretty much treated like men, which would mean pretty shabbily. All right, and finally, our last question. Um, did the Victorian period influence writers outside England? If so, how? It did. And mainly because Dickens was the most famous writer in English ever. And so I will say Dostoevsky of all people said he owed more to Dickens 
for writing dark characters because the last, you know, Dickens starts out with Pickwick papers, but the last third of his writing is very depressing and very socially oriented with criticism. And so Dostoevsky was a huge fan of Dickens. He was beloved in Germany, but that is nothing compared to the United States. We worship Dickens. A writer like Louisa May Alcott writing Little Women, you know, those women had a lot of um, spunk as Lou Grant said that uh, Mary Tyler Moore did, uh, uh, Mary Richards did, uh, and Mark Twain, though he would never admit it, was greatly influenced by the Victorian novel. I do want to mention Dickens' second novel, Oliver Twist, is the first novel in history that makes a child the central character in literature. There were no children with main characters. Oliver Twist is the first in 1838. I mentioned that because there would be no Mark Twain. He came 50 years later, no Huck Finn, no Tom Sawyer, no Becky Thatcher, because it was Dickens and the Victorian novel, many others, who opened literature to children. It had never been opened before. I mean, Tiny Tim is one of the most famous characters in all Victorian literature, not just because he says, God bless us, everyone, but because he's a child and nobody ever thought of that before. So the Russians and the Germans and even the French who can't stand the English basically, but even they weren't crazy about Dickens, but they had to admit that not just Dickens, but he and his brothers and sisters, the Victorian writers influenced them. And the other reason for the one and only time in England's history during the Victorian period, they were the most powerful nation on earth. It would never come again. They weren't the most powerful before 1837, they would never be after World War I, which is really the end of the Victorian period, even though it's Edwardian. And so because they were the most powerful nation on earth, because they were the richest, they were the most influential. That doesn't mean the Victorian writers, the novelists were the greatest, but they were read by more people because England was more famous than it would ever be again. Let me just say they were wonderful questions and my favorite thing about them Nobody stumped me and I sure don't know everything. So I appreciate your asking things that I could profess on and act like a professor. Well, thank you for your generosity in going through and answering those questions and for the enlightening and very entertaining uh, talk. Um, Please. I think you, uh, you definitely managed to make a uh, Victoria who maybe people thought were droll very interesting. So thank, thank you. you. And I don't I'm, play hard to get, have me back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to uh, introduce the executive director of the English Speaking Union, Karen Karpovich, uh, to say a few words. Karen? Anyway, thank you very much, Professor Engels. I was so happy that you mentioned Delton because I was going to mention Delton myself. And my greatest memory of Delton when I came on board was always hearing from Delton looking for speakers. And he loved good conversation and he loved good speakers. In a way, these happy hours are really an homage to him because mm -hmm. I think he probably would not have understood the technology or liked the technology, but in its way it is homage to him and his love of conversation and good lectures. So thank you so much, Professor Engels. And I think you hit with a lot of our other members throughout the country. So thank you again. I, I just want to again, thank everyone for coming us with us this evening and joining us again. Uh, it was an honor to be part of the Shreveport branch, and as I said, you know, they've always had such a reputation for good conversation and good lectures, so it was good sharing a part of who they are. I, I just want everyone to remember that um, we have our AGM coming up the weekend of October the 14th. Uh, we hope that you join us at the conference and also at the AGM. It, this year, again, it will be virtual, so please register. And if you are a member of the English Speaking Union, please renew your membership. And if you're not, I encourage you to become a member. And stay tuned for more, stay tuned for more happy hours as they roll out for the new year of the fall. And I know there's one that's going to be really interesting. It's going to deal with uh, appraisals. And uh, so you'll have an opportunity to bring your family jewels and have them appraised by one of our very talented board members, Robin Sinclair. Anyway, thank you very much and have a wonderful evening.